I'm Ivan Zawitsky from the Carbon Trust, and I'm here today to speak about the Offshore Renewables Joint Industry Programme, or ORGIP, for offshore wind. ORGIP was set up to help reduce offshore wind consenting risk. So ORGIP uh, conducts research into the environmental impact of offshore wind to help reduce um, consenting risk and to support achieving industry capacity targets. The objective is to increase the uh, evidence base behind uh, which consenting decisions are made. At present, ORGIP is in its second stage and currently comprises nine developer partners and four non-developer partners um, that you can see on screen there. ORGIP operates within a number of focus areas and these focus areas define the research that we do. Um, we've recently updated these focus areas and the, these are quite broad and encompass many of the consenting challenges for offshore wind. Um, the list is prioritised in terms of uh, the potential for research to reduce consenting risk uh, and we're hoping to conduct further projects in, within each of these areas. Firstly, impacts on ornithology, which has been our most prolific um, focus area to date. Secondly, cumulative impact assessment. Uh, and we look to incorporate this into each of the projects that we run within ORGIP. Thirdly, impacts on marine mammals, including underwater noise, entanglement and barrier effects. Commercial fishing coexistence. Marine net gain and positive biodiversity impacts, including from compensation actions. And um, this is a kind of recent development within our focus areas. Six, impacts of onshore and offshore transmission assets associated with offshore wind, including submarine cables. Seven, impacts on benthic ecology. Eight, impacts of underwater noise on fish. And nine, any, and any other additional issues. And we include this because the objective of the focus areas uh, is to elicit calls for ideas. So um, we are likely to have a new call for project ideas in early in 2023. And we're hoping that this will build upon existing resources uh, that document key evidence gaps required and, and research required for offshore wind environmental impacts, such as the OWEA. Um, but we're also looking for any additional ideas that might fit within these focus areas or indeed be able to reduce offshore wind consenting risk. At present, there are four live audit projects that are due to close shortly and share results in early 2023. And I'll just give a brief overview of these and what to expect. Firstly, reducing conservatism and underwater noise assessments. The objective here was to review measured underwater noise data during piling installation to analyse differences in noise levels, frequency, duration, etc. for different piling strategies. And this project analysed uh, real project data from offshore wind installations in the North Sea to assess if there were differences between sound exposure levels expected during uh, acoustic modelling versus what was measured offshore. Uh, and this will be report um, through a peer review journal and um, as well as with uh, reports on the Carbon Trust website uh, early in 23. Secondly, quantification of mortality rates associated with displacement. The objective of this project was to review current rates that are, re that are used in the determination process for mortality of birds associated with displacement of offshore wind farms and to deliver more ecologically accurate species level estimates of mortality rates. And this project has gone down an expert elicitation path to elicit those new rates that could be used in future assessments. Thirdly, apportioning seabirds seen at sea. The objective here was to reduce uncertainty in how the offshore wind sector apportioned seabirds recorded during at sea surveys and deliver an improved apportioning tool for future assessments. And that tool will be going live in uh, end of March 23. And finally, bird sensitivity mapping phase two. The objective here was to further develop the bird sen sensitivity mapping tool created under ORGIP stage one and to integrate the tool within the cumulative effects framework. Uh, so this will be launched within the within the CEF. And there are two further projects that commence in October 22. Um, firstly, integration of tracking and at sea survey data. The objective here is to integrate survey and telemetry data for seabirds into a joint analysis of the distribution or an essence in essence, rather, uh, to be able to correctly apportion the effects of, of potential disturbance at sea to individual colonies and critically to be able to account for non-breeders within that apportioning. And the other project that started late last year is rain dependent, range dependent nature of impulsive noise. And this is a follow on of the previous marine mammal work. The objective here is to develop a framework for use in noise impact assessments that assesses impulsivity of noise with range from the source and also the subsequent risk of injury to marine mammals. So I hope that was able to give you a little bit of a flavour of where we're at with audit projects at present and what to expect within the coming months. 
Um, really looking forward to engaging in with many of you during the um, ex the project idea elicitation process and the subsequent prioritisation. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, any questions that you have now. And please feel free to reach out to me, um, likewise, with any discussion on any of our focus areas. So thank you very much and yeah, cheers. Bye bye. Hi everyone, it's good to see you all today. My name is Dickon Howell, I'm a director at HMC, but I'm also a professor of practice at Newcastle Uni and the programme co-champion for the EcoWin programme. I've spent a large part of my career trying to figure out the best way to get scientists and policymakers working well together so we can get the right evidence needed to make good decisions at pace. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of what we're doing within the EcoWin programme to try and bridge this gap. EcoWin brings together experts from science, policy and industry to understand how offshore wind affects ecosystems and the species and habitats that make them in order to reduce negative impacts on marine life while tackling climate change. Scientists, policy and industry representatives are working closely together to ensure that research findings can be directly translated into progressive policy measures, which will aim for optimal outcomes for both the climate and marine life. EcoWind is funded by NERC and the Offshore Wind Evidence and Change Programme, which is a DEFRA and BASE programme that is managed by the Crown Estate. And you can see our three objectives on the screen here. EcoWind kicked off at the end of the summer, and we have three excellent projects led by Bangor, CEH and Aberdeen. In brief, we have EcoWings, which is investigating how the cumulative ecosystem change brought about by the deployment of offshore wind is impacting seabird populations, Accelerate is looking at the ecological implications of effects on the benthos around wind farms and Pelagio is undertaking a physics to ecosystem level assessment of the impacts of offshore wind farms with a focus on the ecological implications of a change in mixing. EcoWind Accelerate is being led by Katrine van Landerhem from Bangor University and is focused on the benthic ecosystem. It will deliver a range of outputs that speak to the three core aims of the EcoWind programme. In particular, the project will support the development of environmental simulations and prediction systems across a range of offshore wind farm sizes, use predictive mod modelling to map behavioural adjustments in key species and develop a public facing tool that allows stakeholders to understand the potential impacts of offshore wind developments on marine habitats in their region. Eco Wings is being led by Francis Daunt from CEH and is focused on the ecosystem interactions between seabirds and their prey. It will inform the implementation of policy around offshore wind development, providing strategic advice that safeguards the future welfare of seabird populations and the wider ecosystem, whilst removing key barriers to progress towards ambitious energy targets. Working from an initial case study region, the project will use modelling to scale results across the North Sea and will produce a suite of online tools to inform policy and management. Pelagio is being led by Beth Scott from the University of Aberdeen and is focused on oceanographic change, in particular wind energy extraction and mixing and how this drives changes in the ecosystem. It will deliver a number of outputs that inform the delivery of net gain and help the UK work towards and maintain good environmental status. These include the use of integrated measures to understand what drives changes in marine ecosystems, producing tools to assess trade-offs to inform policy, and using data from autonomous platforms and robotic surveys to establish an evidence base to understand the ecological footprint of offshore wind farms. Working from selected case study sites, the project outputs will be made scalable through the use of ecosystem models that assess the dynamic effects of changes across natural, social, and economic metrics. EcoWind is probably more focused on research impact than any other NERC marine programme. Many of you will be familiar with the UKRI definition of impact, which is broad enough to include impact on society, the economy, individuals, organisations and nations, as well as rightly placing the concept of science excellence at its heart. In the marine science world, when we talk about impact, we're often referring to impact on how our oceans are managed. When we come to impact within government, there is no concrete definition, but it is often considered to, to be research that can contribute to decision making and enable the development and delivery of government policy outcomes such as these. 
This is a really fast moving policy space and we're working hard as champions to make sure we're as linked into it as possible and then feed that information through to our PIs to ensure that their projects can have as much impact as possible. We've used a theory of change approach to define activities and outputs from the program for our stakeholder or user community and ask them two simple questions. What work are you already doing that aligns with these activities and which areas of your work do you think these outputs could be useful for? Following these conversations, which happened uh, late last year, we are building an effective and targeted impact actions across each project that are meaningful to those who need them. Some of the key impact areas we're focusing on can be seen on the screen here. We're currently working with delivery partners in government, industry and academia to determine specific impact actions, actions across the program, which will be captured in the EcoWind impact strategy, which will be finalized in the next month. As well as specific impact actions, as program champions, we have a key role to play in ensuring that the work within EcoWind is being coordinated effectively with other research programs and initiatives from both the public and private sector. We've already had very productive conversations with most of the areas on this slide at both the strategic and operational level. And it's great to see the three EcoWind projects already working closely with Prepared, Poseidon and the Offshore Wind Industry Council, as well as the many connections we have with the Insight programme. The last three days of the Scott Mayer programme have shown us that there is lots more that we can be connecting with and that this is going to be a very vibrant uh, community over the next five to 10 years. Thank you for listening today. Um, if anyone has any questions about the EcoWin program, please do get in contact with me um, or my colleague, Hank Van Rain, who is also speaking today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Mogensen. I am a Senior Marine Mammal Advisor at JNCC. And for this talk, I'm going to overview the Offshore Wind Environmental Evidence Register, also known as the OIR. This is a similar tool to the Scott Mayer Evidence Maps and has been created over the last two years. I'll be overviewing the background and content of the OIR and will highlight some of the key similarities and differences in the programmes. The OIR project was commissioned by the Crown Estate through the OIC programme. The OIR was managed by DEFRA and the tool itself has been created by JNCC. The OIR aims to act as a UK-wide and publicly available register of prioritised strategic environmental evidence gaps and current research projects relating to offshore wind. The purpose of the OIR was initially to assist with prioritising OIC funding, but it also acts as a live and publicly available resource, aims to increase understanding of the current breadth and scope of research within offshore wind, and for awareness raising and sharing of research findings to facilitate debate, discussion and change. And this last point has been primarily through two forums held in the last two years. The first version of the OIR was published in June 2021 and there have been further three iterations published roughly every six months until the latest version in uh, January this year. This is a screenshot of the latest version of the OIR published last month. The OIR is an Excel database divided into a number of tabs which I'll briefly go through now. The OIR is divided into a number of different tabs. Firstly, there are a number of tabs that help users interpret the OIR, such as a README and a user guide. The rest of the OIR is dedicated to technical information. The first five tabs are the evidence gap registers, divided into the receptor groups of benthic, ornithology, marine mammals, fish, and overarching information for those projects that don't fit a specific receptor group. Similarly, the peach colored tabs list the research projects, again divided into those same receptor groups. Within the evidence gap spreadsheets, each row represents one evidence gap. The spreadsheet is further divided into a number of different sections. The first describes and details each evidence gap. The second shows the prioritization process. The third links and overlaps both within the OIR and also externally. And fourth, the different topics, which can be subdivided and filtered. And the fifth is metadata. Number two there, the prioritization process in green. This is where each evidence gap has been ranked in terms of its priority. 
This is primarily based on consenting risk, but a number of other factors as well. This process is detailed in the OER itself. Similarly, each row in the current research spreadsheets documents an individual research project. The spreadsheet is divided into similar sections, but additionally contains information on the project partners, the status of any project, and links to outputs in any publications. The OE was populated by voluntary contributions from a wide range of stakeholder organisations involved in offshore wind. We've increased the number of organisations from 28 in version 1 in 2021 to 40 organisations in version 4 published last month. The OA project has made huge strides in the two years the project has been running. Alongside a project advisory group of stakeholder organisations, the first OA structure and content was formed and four versions have been created. We've added five receptor groups of data and documented hundreds of evidence gaps and research projects. We've agreed a prioritisation process for evidence gaps, improved the usability of the tool and increased the breadth of organisations contributing. Two high priority evidence gaps reports have also been published, which detail high priority themes needing urgent research within each of the receptor groups. We've also hosted two forums to bring together stakeholders from offshore wind to discuss the OER itself, but also barriers, opportunities and needs within offshore wind research. There are links and overlap between the OER and the SCOMET evidence maps, but there are also some key differences. The OER is UK wide, but the evidence maps are Scotland focused. The OER is focused on the environment only, but the evidence maps also cover socioeconomic aspects and physical processes. The OER incorporates the evidence maps within the database and the evidence maps have links to the high priority areas from the reports I mentioned earlier. The OER relies on voluntary contributions from organisations, whereas the evidence maps are populated through specialist workshops. And finally, the OER has so far been a temporary programme of two years uh, and has been updated every six months, whereas the SCOTMARE programme is an ongoing programme. There is mutual representation between the two programmes, with assigned representatives from JNCC and SCOTMARE on the respective project boards. Lastly, I wanted to mention uh, future plans for the OER. The most up-to-date version was version 4, published on the 13th of January. This contains up-to-date information, new search functions, improved usability and information content, uh, but this is the last within the current plans for this project. We are hoping to continue the OER. Uh, the idea is to hopefully make it an online resource, so a live OER database, rather than the six monthly updates as it has been so far. And we're hoping this will have a easier user interface uh, and will allow for easier and more regular contributions from contributing organisations. However, these plans are only in the discussion phase, so we will keep you updated. And very lastly, I would like to say thank you to the Crown Estate and the Offshore Wind Evidence and Change Programme for funding the OER work. And thanks also to the DEFRA and JNCC staff for their efforts in producing the register. Finally, thanks to all the contributors for providing their time to populate the OER. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lise Ruffineau, a senior marine ornithologist at the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, and I'm also the project manager of ARSMERF, which is the Offshore Wind Strategic Monitoring and Research Forum. And this afternoon, I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of ARSMERF main achievements. ARSMERF is a collaborative partnership led by a group of offshore wind developers and coordinated by JNCC. AUSMERF provides a forum for the nature country agencies, regulators and others involved in the offshore wind sector to actively engage with academics, experts and industry to then identify critically important knowledge gaps and scientifically robust research and monitoring that will help provide more certainty around the likely impacts of offshore wind farm developments on marine birds in the UK. How does this work? Uh, first, we consult with key stakeholders to identify a list of key seabird species or groups of species that convey the greatest uncertainty, as well as the most important issues associated with these species or groups of species. That could be, for example, collision risk mortality, displacement, at sea behaviour. Then we identify a list of high level research opportunities to fill in those gaps. 
alongside information on the feasibility of the research. Then key stakeholders advise on which research are likely to provide the, um, the greatest reduction in uncertainty. And then recommendations are made to the developer group. Highly detailed research proposals are then developed um, by a working group made of key stakeholders, academics and developers. And then most importantly, we work with a wide range, range of UK research delivery bodies um, to promote the, the research ideas, avoiding duplication and maximising impact. So what have we achieved so far? During the pilot year, uh, running from 2019 to 2020, we focused on the Black Lekiti Week and we produced three knowledge gap reports covering areas related to collision risk mortality, connectivity between offshore wind farm and um, SPAs and population dynamics. In these reports, we highlighted a list of 20 important research opportunities, which were translated into high level concept notes as well as five detailed scopes of work. And during the continuation year, which is running to 2023, um, we've focused on uh, shearwater and storm petrol river species and produced one report covering three main knowledge gaps, namely at sea distribution, population estimates and demographic rates. In this report, we highlighted a list of 18 research opportunities, which are currently being translated into concept notes. And we're also working uh, into developing a scope of work, as well as a full project proposal, which is now awaiting a uh, funding decision. And all the outputs um, are now published on the GNCC website. So here I've indicated uh, the list of 20 research opportunities that emerged from the work during the pilot year on Kitty Wake across the three main knowledge gaps. And GNCC using a project tracker, as well as the OWARE, the Offshore Wind Environmental Evidence Register, which has been last updated um, mid-January, to identify those research opportunities that have been already taken forward. So I've already mentioned that um, a number of these ROs have been uh, developed into scopes of work. And the green ticks indicate here um, the ROs, the research opportunities that have been fully taken forward already, while the orange ROs indicate those um, research opportunities that have been partially taken forward, for example, through one or two discrete uh, work packages. And to finish, I'd like here to highlight a list of examples of projects that directly emerge from the work of ASMUF, in this case, uh, from the pilot here on Kitty Wake. Um, to address questions related to collision risk uh, monitoring, um, OGIP funded a um, couple of projects, one being a review of systems for monitoring bird collisions at offshore wind farms, and the second one being power analysis. Um, the questions of um, mark recapture studies, the need to better understanding um, and connectivity um, between populations and between offshore wind uh, farm areas and SPAs, as well as population dynamics, um, have been taken forward by two projects. Uh, one project funded by Vattenfall, um, which is a feasibility study for large scale deployment of mark recapture systems, a project that delivered in 2021. And the second project funded by OWEC um, and led by the RSPB uh, is a remote tracking of Seabird at Sea project, looking into uh, innovative remote tracking technology. There's also a PhD um, funded through the NERC DTP program and um, led by the University of Aberdeen on Kitiwik meta population dynamics modeling using genetics. And finally, uh, Allstead funded a project uh, coordinated and led by GNCC, uh, which is an evidence uh, review of Kitiwik and fish prey relationship. And I'll finish here. Thanks for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Jan van Averbeke. I'm working at the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences. 
And today I'm going to introduce you to the work of three uh, ISIS groups that are dealing with uh, research um, the effects of marine renewable energy devices on the, on the marine environment. I have to start by saying that I'm actually not speaking on behalf of ISIS as an organization. I'm speaking on behalf of myself as a scientist, explaining you what uh, all these uh, groups are doing. So let's just move on. There, there are three main groups uh, that have a focus on the effect of offshore renewables on the marine environment. And they all have a wonderful acronyms. Um, the first one you see on your left is the Working Group on Offshore Wind Developments and Fisheries, actually investigating the relationship between uh, the installation and exploitation of offshore wind farms and um, the fisheries activities. The second one is the Working Group on Offshore Renewable Energy. As you see from the title, they have a much wider approach interested in general um, offshore renewable energy devices, not so much on, uh, on offshore wind farms alone. And the last one is the oldest one established uh, 10 years ago, which is the Working Group on Marine Bental Renewable Energy Devices. And they are focusing on the effects of marine renewable energy devices on the bento. So it's, it's a more focused group. Uh, from the membership, you can see that they're quite large groups. There's quite some interest. And this, the, all, all this is, uh, is really established within uh, ISIS. And you can also see from, from, from the participating countries and, and, uh, and, and the expertise that there is indeed a very wide interest in the science that is uh, associated with um, offshore renewable energy devices. All these groups work along so-called terms of references, which are actually summarizing uh, what these groups are doing in, in periods of three years. And if you start with, uh, with these terms of references from MRED, then you actually see that this group uh, um, deals with methodology on, on data collection. That's tradition within that group also since, since 10 years. Um, in this case, in the current term, we are dealing with uh, reviewing data collection using uh, non-invasive imaginary benthic uh, footage um, um, stuff. Um, the second, uh, the second uh, term of reference deals with uh, with investigating or reviewing the effects of the uh, of energy emissions. So that's uh, just heat, uh, electromagnetic fields that are that are coming from. Uh, um, offshore renewable energy installations and affecting the marine environment. We're also looking forward, and I mean, there's one thing is about installation and exploitation of wind farms. This will affect the bentos, but also the decommissioning will certainly have a large effect on, on, on the bentos. And we're trying to guide the process there by, by collecting and reviewing the information. And then the last two tours deal a bit with the so what question. This is uh, investigating or reviewing uh, the knowledge um, of how offshore renewables affect marine ecosystem functioning and therefore also uh, the provisioning of ecosystem services. We are, I mean, Emirates is there for now 10 years, so it means they have a tangible output. Um, to the left, you see actually a, a very recent output, which has been, um, um, which has been submitted very recently um, for publication. And that's actually a biodiversity information system. So it means we actually compiled all the available biological data uh, related to man-made structures in a single database that can then be used by whoever is interested in, in, in doing analysis. But we really also hope that people would add that data to our database. To the right, you see, uh, you see a, a picture from one of our papers in which we actually built the knowledge base um, um, that supports um, our understanding of how the presence of offshore wind farms actually affect the marine uh, environment through effects to changes on the abiotic environment, which then cascades into um, into biology. So it is, uh, is actually uh, the knowledge base is, is, is summarized in that paper. Um, and it's also a way to, to, to guide future um, research. If we then move to the next group, which is the group on offshore wind farm developments and fisheries, of course, what they do is reviewing these interactions in the first terms of reference 
Um, they also develop methodology on data collection uh, to, to have all these things standardized as much as possible because standardization uh, um, will, will facilitate uh, comparisons across areas, across regions, and so on and so on. They focus on the effect of offshore wind farms on changes in the habitat and therefore on fish populations and fisheries. And they review the ISIS expertise to see where they can get the necessary um, brains and data to help um, reaching their goals. They're a younger group, so and their results are, are emerging, uh, are still in the pipeline, but still very interesting. Man. They they mapped, uh, they have a cause effect map, map, sorry, um, focusing on the relationship between offshore wind farms and fisheries activities. And by doing this, they could identify key economic, socio-economic factors um, in that relationship. So they go, they, they, they do not only do biology, they, they involve so, uh, socioeconomics in, uh, in, in their activities. They identified data gaps, uh, how they can be collected, uh, um, challenges in that data collection. So I'm really moving forward the field of, uh, of, of documenting these changes. And in the future, they will produce a precious state impact model model linking offshore wind farms with fisheries in a, in a, in a logical in a logical way. And this brings me to the last group. This is the group on offshore renewable energy, which is from the title, uh, you, you can already deduce they are wider than the more focused Bental uh, group or the, or the fisheries group. Um, they deal with cumulative impact um, assessments. They are also reviewing uh, uh, um, items that are not tackled by, by by the other groups. In this case, now they focus on the effects of chemicals in the in the marine environment. They really keep an eye on emerging technologies, emerging renewable energy devices that then have their effects on the on the environment, and they keep on reviewing and reporting the knowledge uh, on emerging env environmental issues for all the. Um, devices that are available. So what do we expect from them or what, what, what they will, uh, will, will produce um, is really integrated knowledge uh, harvesting from um, specialist groups on bentos, on birds, on marine mammals and bringing it into the field of research on offshore renewable energy. They will produce applied scientific knowledge to support management, marine spatial planning, these kind of things. Uh, of renewable energy developments at local and larger scale, and they're going to warn us if there are new technologies that are emerging and that have uh, associated environmental concerns that should be tackled in one of the specialist groups. And with this view on many turbines in the Belgian part of the North Sea, I would like to thank you for your attention.